say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. I'm a California boy, born and raised. I, I, don't, I haven't spent a whole lot of time outside of California. I've learned a few different cultures. But I have enjoyed over the last few years of enjoy- getting to know several friends from seminary who, who come from, the, the, from Kentucky and the South. How many of you guys here are from the South? I'm not talking L.A., but like the southern United States. <laughs> All right, so we have a few from the south in here. You know, some of the friends I'm meeting, I, I, you know, I, I've gotten to know their love for fried chicken, uh, something called collard greens, uh, southern barbecue, and, and they're all about this thing called sweet tea. Uh, they, they watch high school football on Friday nights. They, they watch college football. I will not mention any teams, just in case people get a little crazy about that, on Saturdays, and then they all go to church on Sunday mornings. But you know what? Even in the south, times are changing. Ross Douthat of the New York Times has described our culture as post-Christian America. In fact, there have been several news stories about the rise of the nuns, not the singing kind from the sound of music, but N-O-N-E-S, those who would identify themselves as, my religion is nothing. I don't have a religion. It's nothing in particular. In fact, a Pew Research study conducted a couple years ago said that evangelical Protestantism went down from 26% to 25% from 2007 to 2014. Religious nuns went from 16% to 23% in that time. So there's about as many nuns as there are evangelical Protestants. Actually, among, e- among millennials, that number's up to 35%. 35%. That means within tw- uh, 20 years or so that they'll, we'll be vastly outnumbered by those who would say that their religion is nothing. And so what does that mean for us? What do we do? Uh, is it time for us to panic? And, and, I, and I would say that we don't have to, to wring our hands and clench our fists and, 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 and just time to freak out. But we do need to decide, and we need to decide quickly, how we're going to engage this changing culture that we live in. And if we decide to engage this culture, I would say that if we would real, we're going to realize that, that this change in our culture could actually be an opportunity for the church. Russell Moore, the president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptists, who in his wonderful book Onward, which I highly recommend, he says this, that the marginalization of Christianity may be bad news for America as its influence wanes, but it can be good news for the church. He says it's good news for the church. See, 1 Peter 2 calls us as the church strangers and aliens, that we should be strange to the culture around us. And you know what? We are strange if we believe what the Bible says to the culture around us, right? We believe in the dignity of every human life from the womb to the Alzheimer's ward to the cemetery. We believe that marriage is created by God and between one man and one woman for a lifetime. We believe a lot of strange things about justice and sexuality and family and children and a host of issues. But I'll tell you what, my friends, we're much stranger than that. That that we celebrate today on Palm Sunday, we read the passage in Luke 19, we live in the midst of this culture of this victorious imagery of Aragorn and Lord of the Rings being crowned king amongst the multitudes of this great procession. We, we live in the, the age of movies of, of victorious Avengers, right? And, and, and a, of a, a, a procession on chariots with flaming garments behind people, right? We live in these images and we say we worship our king who rides on a donkey on a dusty road in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. And this one who's our king we worship is going to be rejected and executed in the most brutal fashion. And we believe that our king rose from the dead 
and ascended into heaven. And, and compared to all these other moral beliefs, I mean, this one's got to take the kicker, right? We believe that our king is going to show up one day in the sky riding a horse to come rule the universe. I mean, this is unbelievable to our culture, right? It's unbelievable. And so in the midst of such differences with our culture, we can ask the question, how do we share Jesus with a culture that is characterized by such difference and such unbelief? And I would suggest that that we would follow the example that Luke gives here. As Luke presents the gospel to this Gentile culture, and, and, and Luke 19, 28 through 40 talks about this king. So I think that we need to do two things if we're going to communicate the gospel to this unbelieving culture. First, we need to present and understand the unconventional king. And secondly, we need to recognize the unmistakable responses to that king. So let's look at the text and let's look at the, this unconventional king that we worship and his unconventional task in verse 28. Verse 28 says, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Now, the context is important here. See, all the way in the whole second half of Luke, since chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. The whole purpose of Jesus in this whole second half of Luke was to get to Jerusalem. He was focused on this divine task where he was going to be king and savior. But it's an unconventional task because Luke says he had just said some things and that these things that that. that Jesus had just said in verses 11 through 27 is a parable that Jesus had just told about how the king is going to come and people are going to reject their king. So Jesus knows he's going to Jerusalem as king and savior and he knows that when he gets there, he's going to be rejected. And he knows that rejection leads to death. He knows that he's walking to rejection and death. And yet he's still determined and focused about that. Well, why is that? Why is Jesus so determined about that? Well, Jesus is is going to be fulfilling some very unconventional promises. Look at verse 29. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, or the Mount of Olives. This scene, if you can picture it, is to the east of Jerusalem. So if Jerusalem's here, it's on the east of Jerusalem. That on the east of Jerusalem, as it slopes up, you find the Mount of Olives, which has a beautiful, beautiful view of the Temple Mount. And then beyond that, about three-fifths of a mile, you find Bethany and Bethpage. So it's about, it's a little little bit less than a mile away as you approach the eastern approach to Jerusalem. And as they approach these towns, Jesus talks and and gives some instructions to to his disciples to go get this colt. It's really interesting. Out of 13 verses of the triumphal entry, six of them, almost half, are about this animal. And, and, And Luke just gives us all these details about this animal. In fact, Luke doesn't give us a bunch of details that I personally wish he would have given us. Questions as I read the text, I would ask. I would say, who were the two disciples that went? I mean, was Judas one of them? That just would be interesting, right? Who, are, were they part of the 12? Were they other disciples? Which village did they go to? Here's my biggest question for Luke. Why were people just letting him take their animal? The Lord has need of it. Okay, so do I, right? I, I mean, there's some questions I would have, but Luke doesn't care about any of that. Instead, Luke is just focused on this animal, this colt. He gives all these details. It was untied and untied and untied and untied. You can count five times. Untied, 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 untied. Five different times. He says it's never been written. He tells them what to say to the owners. And he tells the whole story twice. If I was writing this book and trying to condense things and get it in the hands of people to hear about Jesus, I would just say, here's what Jesus said and give the details and say, it's exactly what happened, Right? But he goes through the whole story again, showing exactly what happens with this animal. Luke wants us focused on this colt. Okay, what's a colt, right? The word for colt means young animal. It can be a horse or a donkey or anything really you ride on. So if you want to be, you know, a biblical nerd and give your lawnmower a biblical name, you can call it a colt or, or polos in Greek or ayer in Hebrew and just be like, I got a biblical lawnmower, Right? But in Matthew 21, it tells us this colt, the particular animal that Jesus was riding on, was a donkey. And Luke calls it a colt because Jesus was going to ride on it. And Luke shows us that Jesus is very intentional about getting this colt. I mean, think about it. For miles and miles and miles, Jesus has been walking to Jerusalem, right? Miles, all through Galilee, all through Judea, Jesus is walking to Jerusalem. And then the very last three-fifths of a mile, he wants to ride. 
I mean, what is up with that, right? This is a very important symbol for this last three-fifths of a mile. And then, and then we see again that, that, that Luke tells us this twice. This is very important. Now, I, I, Luke doesn't make it clear, is this Jesus supernaturally, because he's God, he knows all things, supernaturally knew what was going to happen, so he tells the disciples all the details to get the cult? Or was Jesus so intentional that he kind of set all this up beforehand to make sure that this happened? I don't think Luke tells us. I, I don't think he's concerned with that. But I think that he kind of presents the situation and says, you can draw your own conclusions. Personally, I think that it's supernatural because he does say it happened exactly as Jesus said. But here's the point. There are pages and pages in the commentaries I read about this debate. And you read the text and Luke doesn't care. What Luke is saying, Jesus wants this cult. This cult was very important for Jesus. So we got to understand why. So why is this cult so important? Well, first of all, it's a symbol of kingship. If we were to look back in 1 Kings 133, we see that when Solomon was going to be coronated as king, David instructed for Solomon to ride in on his, take a guess, colt, his donkey, right? And so Jesus is going to ride in just like Solomon. He's going to be a king just like Solomon. But It's better than that, greater than that. That David and Solomon pointed to a greater king that was coming. Turn your Bibles back to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9. It's near the end of the Old Testament. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So if you find back to Matthew and go back a couple books, you'll find it. Back to Zechariah chapter 9. Chapter 9 in Zechariah begins with judgment promised on Israel's enemies. And it ends with the promise that Yahweh, God, is going to come save his people. And and then it says that this king that Yahweh is going to send to save his people is going to come in just like Solomon in 1 Kings 1. Look at Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In Zechariah 9, 9, we have this picture of a humble and gentle king who is also victorious. He's bringing victory. He's a king. He's bringing salvation. But he's also humble. And he's going to bring the peace and prosperity of God with him. That's the hope of the whole Old Testament. I talked about that a couple weeks ago. The whole Old Testament, they're waiting for this promised king to come and bring righteousness and justice where peace would reign and the knowledge of God would fill the earth. That, that this is that king that was coming. He was going to bring salvation, we see later in chapter 9. He's bringing this hope of this new creation, almost like a new Eden. He's going to fulfill all the promises of Abraham there in verses 16 and 17. And this is what Jesus and Luke see that Jesus is doing in the triumphal entry. Look at all the parallels with Luke. It's not just a cult, but later we see that that word mounted on, the same thing as Jesus, and also that people would rejoice at this. That what we see is that what's taking place in Luke is that Jesus is intentionally, on purpose, reenacting this prophecy from Zechariah. He's identifying himself with the king. Jesus is saying, I am the one that's promised. I am the one that the whole Old Testament promised. I am the one who brings peace and justice and righteousness to the world. That Jesus is this king. He's the Davidic Messiah. And he's a king, though, not just in victory, but he's also a king that comes humbly in meekness to serve. We see these these unconventional characteristics of Jesus in this prophecy. He's victorious, but he's also humble. Look back in Luke Look back in Luke with me at verses 35 and 36. Luke 35 and 36, where it says, And they brought it, the colt, to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. I want you to picture in your mind what's going on. People are literally taking off their jackets and their cloaks, and they're laying them on this donkey. They're laying them on this dusty road for Jesus. Right? This is, Jesus is someone of massive importance for them. I mean, the closest thing I could think of to compare it today is a red carpet. If you're, if you're an Academy Award person, 
I'm more of a Super Bowl guy. But if you're an Academy Award person and you watch that, the people that walk that red carpet, they get interviewed and taken pictures of, they are special people in our culture. Whether they're special people in general, I don't know. But they're special people to our culture, right? As they walk that red carpet. And, and it's kind of like that, except it wasn't a red carpet. It was a bunch of clothes. But it's kind of that idea. But if you contrast that, it's, it is very different at the same time. Compared to a red carpet or in those days, a Roman emperor entering a city or things like Aragorn and the Lord of the Rings or things like the Hunger Games and the chariots of fire, or the clothes of fire on chariots, it is very different because he's not just a Messiah of raw power, which is what people were expecting, but he's a Messiah who's going to come humbly and he's going to come to serve and even to die to, to, to serve people. See, we see these unconventional characteristics of Jesus. He's the king that's promised in the Old Testament. He's like Solomon. He is triumphant. And at the same time, he's the humble king. He, he comes with meekness and humility. He's on a donkey and palm branches instead of trumpets and red carpet. He's triumphant and he's humble. And that's the picture that Luke gives us that we need to understand about our king. And this should tell us two things. First of all, It tells us something about the nature of Jesus' kingship. Jesus came as a humble king, riding on a donkey. I mean, if you really think about it, the triumphal entry didn't seem too triumphal if you were there in human terms, right? And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I would first love to say, welcome. We are glad that you're here. You are welcome here to, to come, and we'd love to share about this Jesus that we're talking about with you. But I can understand how some of the things we're saying may seem strange to you. That that there's this Jesus that we're talking about, the one that Christianity is named for, the one that all these people were singing songs about, right? That that, that we call the Savior is this guy that's just riding on a donkey 2,000 years ago. I mean, it doesn't seem too impressive, right? And I kind of get that. I had a friend in college, his name was Mike, and, and he had a Jewish background. He wasn't a practicing Jew, but he had a Jewish background. And I remember talking to him about Jesus. And he said, Craig, I'm not impressed. I, I mean, you know what? In, in, in the stories and synagogue growing up, we're talking about guys calling down fire from heaven and parting the Red Sea. Uh, what's up with this guy on the donkey? Right? It's just not too impressive. He's like, if I saw Jesus do that, or one of his followers like you, go do that in, in the square at the college? All right, sure. You know, I'll believe. It just doesn't seem too impressive. And I can understand how how you could struggle with that if you're here and hearing about this Jesus and hearing him described and going, I don't get it. But see, what you have to understand, you have to understand about why Jesus was coming. You have to understand about the nature of our human problem and the plan that God was bringing salvation through Jesus. See, it was, you have to understand that God is the creator of all the universe. He created it all. He created you and me. And yet, we live as if we want to kick God off the throne. We live as if there was no creator. We live as if God is not as important as what I want. In fact, often I want to be my own God. That, that's the epitome of what, what the Bible calls sin. We live in this sin, this rebellion against God, which makes it an infinite offense because it's against an infinite holy God, which means we should have to bear an infinite penalty if we have to be punished ourselves for that sin. But then the reason that Jesus was coming is he had to come humbly. Because the only way for us to be reconciled to God, the only way for us to be saved, is if Jesus paid the infinite sacrifice for our infinite sin. That he, as God in flesh, would die for our sin on the cross. So that then, and then rise from the dead, that if we place our faith in him and repent, that that God would see us and treat us as if we were his son. That's why Jesus came humbly. So that we see that on the cross, it is, it is moment of his greatest humility was his t- time of most triumphal victory, right? That, that we celebrate his humiliation this week because it brings about his exaltation. There, there's a, a few years ago, the New York Times wrote an article saying, what's the big deal about Easter? I mean, Christians believe on Easter that Jesus ascended into heaven. What's the big deal about that? And they had to write a, a response saying, we were wrong. That's not, because it's not about when Jesus ascended to heaven. It's about Jesus rising from the dead to show that he has paid the penalty for our sin so that we can have salvation. We can have eternal life now. We can have life of eternity now. 
And he did ascend eventually into heaven. Because, and now the tomb is empty. Pastor Bob, I don't want to rob too much from next week. But the tomb is empty. And it leaves the question, what will we do with Jesus? You know, this, this picture of Jesus as humble and victorious also tells us something is the church. That the, Jesus' kingdom is here. It's triumphal. And yet Jesus' kingdom is not yet here. That we have to wait in humility. It's already, but not yet. So we have to live already, but not yet. I love what Russell Moore calls this. He calls this engaged alienation. That the kingdom is here. That we need to be engaged. We shouldn't retreat from being kingdom people and being salt and light in your friends and your family and your coworkers and our and the fellow citizens in our culture. We need to be engaged in it. See, right now, we can live as triumphal kingdom people, being salt and light in wherever we are in our lives. Whatever you do during the week, whatever you enjoy doing, sports or entertainment or drama or culture, or where you work in our community, or volunteering, or service, or parenting, or friendships, and the places we work, and we eat, and we live, and we spend time. Wherever you go, you bring the kingdom. Because we are kingdom people. The kingdom is here. We have a message of the kingdom. That, 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 see, as a church, it's good things we have all different kinds of ministries, but at times we don't need them. That, that we don't always need a ministry for recreational sports or drama programs or forms, some forms of community service or social gatherings. Those can be really good things. But if we as kingdom people go and we love sports, and so you go play in a rec league and you play with people that aren't believers, you are bringing the kingdom for them to see and hear and taste and touch to them. Christianity is not a, not a religion of come and see. It's a religion of go and tell right? That if you love to serve and you want to be involved and you have a heart for justice in our community, yes, there are things you can do through our church, but there's things you can do alongside of all kinds of people, some of those atheists from our community, but you bring the kingdom there by the way that you serve and live, right? By whatever interest you have, you can bring the kingdom there. That we want to be engaged. The kingdom is here. So we want to be engaged in our world. We want to be engaged, but we also realize that, that that's not our ultimate hope. That, that, that this world now is not our ultimate home. That we also realize that Jesus, we're going to humbly wait for his not yet kingdom that's coming. We can't accomplish all the things of heaven on earth. We wait for heaven, right? We wait for the new, new heavens and new earth. That, that we have to be alienated from the culture. Not distanced, but different. That we, are, that we live as if Jesus is our king. See, if we engage, if you're engaged in, in, in the culture, you're engaged in a, a community friendship group, but you act and live just like everybody else, then, then you're not living for the kingdom. But if you engage and focus on the not yet kingdom, you realize that if you go and you're playing sports, your ultimate goal is not to win the game. If you're involved in, in community drama and plays, your ultimate goal is not to give a great performance. Or if you're serving with, your ultimate goal is not just to improve our community or to gather with friends. Our goal is to honor the king, to share his gospel, to build his church by seeking the lost, to guard his name, by living in a way to challenge false conceptions of what it means to be a Christian. That I would live engaged, but very alien because I live as if Jesus is my king because I believe in his glorious gospel. That's what engaged alienation is. Living in the not yet and already. And that means that we have to really consider and even reconsider our time and our commitments and our hobbies. Do you and do I and do we as a church live in engaged alienation? Are you engaged but very different to our culture? Is your workplace somewhere you just have to be every day? Or is your workplace Somewhere where by the way that you serve and the way that you provide service for our community, that you see it as a way, I am loving my neighbors each and every day. And I'm going to work as if I'm filling the, the second greatest commandment to love my neighbors by the way that I work. And I'm going to live different than everybody else because I'm going to live with integrity. And I'm going to live, and you know what? That, that, that your boss says, no one ever confessed to taking an extra 20 minutes of lunch. I live differently than everybody else because Jesus is my king, Right? 
That, that, that it, it, are your parents, are we talking to our kids and helping them understand how do we engage with the culture but yet be alien to the culture? How do they have friends that are non-Christians? Or how do they, they watch a movie or a TV show that's, that's, that's not VeggieTales, which VeggieTales is great, but the, how do you start to engage in other things but yet start to process that? Right? If they go over and hang out with a non-Christian friend, do you process, hey, what did you guys talk about? How is that different from what King Jesus says? Right? As you watch a movie, do you have the remote and you can just pause it? Wait a minute. How is that different from what King Jesus says? And if you can't pause it at the Met, I don't think they'll let you do that. Then afterwards, you say, hey, how is this different from what King Jesus says? Right? You ask questions about how the worldview is different there. How does this, where does this movie believe that all of life comes from? What's that different from what King Jesus says? What does that movie view as the ultimate biggest problem in the world? How is that different from what King Jesus says? How does this movie say that, that all the problems of this world are going to be solved? How is this movie, what does this movie think we all, where we all go when we die? And how is this all different from what King Jesus says? We're engaged, but we're alien, right? Uh, one last one is that we need to be thinking about our hobbies and our life outside the church. If we are involved with all the church in church activities and then involved with all, other Christians all outside in church activities, then we're not living as God has commissioned us to live, right? That, that we need to start asking, what are my gifts and my joys and the things I love doing and where can I do those in our community to be engaged and be a light for the gospel, right? Where are there areas of our community that have no gospel witness, no gospel testimony? And so how do I take my love for gardening or handyman work or sports and how do I live it there? And and how can I use what I'm interested in to be salt and light? Could you imagine the influence and the impact of our community, what what our church would have on a community if we lived like that? That's what Luke is saying. We want to be engaged because the kingdom is here and yet realizing that we're different but the kingdom is not yet. Because a time is coming when Jesus will return to fill God's plan and reign over the new heavens and the new earth with justice and righteousness. If we had time, we'd flip back to Zechariah because this prophecy of the king on the donkey doesn't stop there. A couple chapter la- chapters later, it says this king is going to give mercy in, in chapter 12 because they're going to look upon the one they have pierced There's a picture of the cross right there in Zechariah. They'll look upon the one they have pierced in 12, 10. And then in 14, 3 and 4, that Jesus is going to return and stand on the Mount of Olives. And he's going to reign with justice and righteousness. So in light of God's plan, in light of Jesus' first and his second coming, his already and his not yet kingdom, we should live lives of engaged, eager expectation, but also living differently because we are persevering faithfully following King Jesus until his second coming. So we live like that return is close. You live like that return is closer than you could ever imagine so that you realize that our hope is not in the state of the Tao. Our hope is not in our possibilities of promotion. Our hope is not in the availability of other godly singles in Oakhurst. Our hope is not in the result of the 2016 election. Our hope is the promise of Jesus returning. And yet, we live in that hope of the second coming, and yet we're engaged right now in light of his first coming. So that we live faithfully as if Jesus could take another 2,000 years. So we save for retirement, so you can faithfully serve and give in your later years. We work hard with plans and goals and even pursue promotions, because we work hard. We, we pray for, if you're single, you pray for, and yes, you pursue godly relationships. That we, in the political process, we engage in the political process with a, politi- with a biblical worldview. We live in light also of his first coming as we await for his second. How do we share Jesus within a culture that's characterized by unbelief? First of all, we have to understand our unconventional king. We, he was triumphant and he was humble. And so we need to live in the same way. We have a triumphant message but we're going to live it out humbly. That we are ki- the kingdom is already and not yet. We are engaged aliens. After that, secondly, as we engage, we need to recognize the unmistakable responses to the king. And the first response that we will see at times is praise and rejoicing. Look at verse 37, 38. And as, as he was drawing near, 
Already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So Jerusalem is in sight. The disciples began to praise and rejoice in in God. And, 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 you know, it's interesting that Luke just focuses on the disciples. We know there's a lot more people rejoicing that day. We know that the multitude was rejoicing that day, but Luke leaves them out. He just focuses on the disciples. He says these disciples that he's focusing on, they're different from the fickle crowd. And they're different from the unbelieving Pharisees, which Luke's going to talk about in a little bit. Luke, out of all the gospel writers, just focuses on the disciples. These disciples, as they consider who Jesus is and the mighty works they'd seen Jesus do, they cry out in praise. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They quote Psalm 118, which Pastor Bob read this morning. But they do it with a twist. Here's a little quiz. See if you can catch the, the change that they make. Here's Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here's what the disciples say. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Did you see what they changed? They put king in there. They say, this one who comes in the name of the Lord, this one who comes with the authority of God is the king, is is the new David. And that's Jesus. They realize that, that Jesus is their king. And and so true disciples, Luke says, realize that Jesus is their king. And not only that, then they they praise with rejoicing. They say, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is an echo of what the the, the angels were singing at Jesus' birth in Luke 2.14 when they said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those to whom he is pleased. And and, and here's what Luke is saying, that the disciples realized the peace of heaven has come to earth. The the peace and eternal life of heaven, the kingdom of heaven has come to earth. That's why Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so we can have and experience that peace and that eternal life. This is what Romans 5 talks about. That because we have been justified, justified, that means that when God looks at me, he can say, Craig, you're pure, you're holy, you're innocent, you are sinless. I declare you righteous. I'll tell you what, if you know me, it ain't true. (laughs) Ask my wife. And that's true for all of us, right? How can God justify us? Because Jesus lived a perfect life for us. And Jesus died on the cross in our place as if he had committed all of our sins. And so that when we believe in Jesus, if we believe and repent, that we are united with Jesus. My favorite illustration, I say over and over, but I'll say over and over and over until I die, is that when God looks at me, he doesn't just see me. I am united with Christ. I have been given his righteousness and he has taken on my sin and paid for it. So when Jesus, when God looks at me, he can't say Craig is righteous. I declare him righteous. But when he sees me united to Jesus, he can say they are righteous. And because we have been justified, Romans 5 says that we have peace with God. We have peace with God. That we were enemies of God. That we tried to kick him off his throne. That we tried to replace God with ourselves. But our sin's been paid for. We can boldly come to the throne of grace because we have peace with God. Now and forever in the new heavens, and the new earth. And, and Luke, I think, is hinting, saying, if you're a true disciple of Jesus, he is more than your king. If you understand this peace that Jesus has brought, he is your treasure. I think the disciples, they had times of knowing and unknowing, but at times of glimpses of knowing, they understood this. In John 6, after the multitudes left Jesus, they got their, they got their all-you-can-eat buffet at the feeding, and they, they, Jesus said some hard sayings, and they abandoned him. And Jesus looked over to the disciples and he said, are you going to leave too? And they said, where shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and come to know you are the Holy One of God. They're saying, Jesus, where else would we go? Where else would we find anything better than the eternal life you give? You are our treasure. I've heard John Piper say that when he invites people to accept Jesus, to become Christians, that he asked them if they would be willing to accept Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord, and he adds on as their treasure. And I think there's something incredibly biblical about that. I think that Luke is pointing to the disciples were treasuring Jesus. 
that, that if you understand who Jesus is and you understand what he did for you and you understand the peace and eternal life and salvation he offers, how could he not be our treasure, right? That if we see him like the disciples, we'd see he's, we, we would believe he is way better than TV and music and video games, than money and investments and promotions, than comfort and control and time, than respect and independence and significance, than health and wealth and prosperity. We would not just put our time in, for, in with Jesus so we can get some, back to something better that we like. No, we would say Jesus is the better, right? That's a picture of a disciple. A disciple is someone who treasures Jesus Christ. And this is how Luke she sees a disciple of Jesus Christ. Someone who believes and treasures Jesus as king. And he, if he were standing right here, I think he would ask us, is that us? Is that Oakhurst TV Free Church? Is that you? Is that me? Because we can't share about Jesus. We can't share about Jesus if, he, if we don't believe in it first. You're not going to be able to convince a culture of unbelief unless you believe it. Unless they see it in your life that you treasure Jesus that way. Why would they ever tre- treasure Jesus that way? Right? Do we demonstrate that? That Jesus is our king and treasures like the disciples when they sing? Do we demonstrate that when we sing and praise and rejoice? I mean, if, there, if, if a non-Christian came to our church this morning and they were to, you know, this, we start singing, they're like, hey, I guess they sing here. And they're watching you. I remember the first time I came to church as, as, a, as a non-believer in high school and everyone stood up and, to sing, right? And I'm like, what are they singing? And some of the songs they had memorized, I'm like, I'm just trying to listen. What are they singing about? I mean, it's just, it was strange for me. And if they were to watch you and they were to listen to us as a church, and if they were to hear us sing things like, no guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, would they believe it? Do we mean things when we sing, hallelujah, glory to be to our great God? Would they see that we mean that when we sing it? You know another way that we demonstrate that Jesus is our treasure? Let me tell you a way that I've been encouraged by this church and how I've seen other people treasure Jesus. You know, I love this church. I haven't been a part of too many churches, but I love this church because of how it edifies me to see how people treasure Jesus by the way that they give. Uh, There are people, to watch how people give of their time, serving in so many areas of the church, finances and Awana and FCFO and maintenance and acts of kindness and encouraging people over lunch and cards and phone calls. I mean, seriously, how many of you have received a phone call of Glenda praying for you, either either on on your birthday or prayer requests or needs? I mean, it's just incredible. She just works through prayer requests. She works through the directory and calls and prays for people. That, 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 that I've personally gotten to work with some of those amazing servants in youth and children's ministries. It's amazing. People could, they, they, you know what? You could go home. They could go home and go binge, binge, uh, binge, binge watch the next Netflix series, but instead they're here at church ministering to people because Jesus is their treasure. By the way, every Wednesday night, these youth workers and Awana workers show up because Jesus is their treasure and they treasure Jesus and his people. And so they show up. It's amazing. And that, that we, I, I watch as people treasure and Jesus by literally giving of their treasure, their finances. How many times has, our, has God used the people of this church to rally around a need for the congregation or for a missions trip or for a budget deficit because of the needs of the church? And people literally treasure Jesus so much that they give up their literal treasure. The world has no category for that, right? The world has no category for that. I can't tell you how many times that a man and I have been so personally blessed by this church and people giving of their time and, and people giving of their, their treasure and, and, and as they bless others and we are included because of p- being a bar- part of the body of this church. And that, that, that we are reminded, wow, Jesus is a treasure. And that, you know what? People see Jesus. There's something about this Jesus that we need encouragement as each other, that we watch each other do this and say there's something about this Jesus that's worth living that way. And imagine what that does to a watching world. Let me give you one more example of how Jesus can be our king and our treasure. That we need to let Jesus be our king and our treasure and the way we evangelize. I want you to listen to this quote from a man named Penn Jillette. Some of you guys know him from the Penn and Teller Illusionist Act. And he talked about when he was evangelized one time by a very polite and impressive man. And he shares about his experience saying this, He says, I've always said, you know, I don't respect people who don't proselytize, who don't evangelize. 
He says, I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever you believe, and you think that, well, it's not really worth telling them because it would make things socially awkward, get this statement. How much do you have to hate somebody not to evangelize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you, and, or if a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, and that truck was bearing down on you, at a certain point I would tackle you. And it seems to me that this eternal life is much more important than that. I'll tell you what, I think this atheist, Penn Jillette, understands Christianity sometimes better than I do, right? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? Do you believe that Jesus is your king? Do you believe that he is your treasure? Do you believe that he is the source of everlasting life? Penn Jillette may disagree with you, but he will respect you for telling him that. How do you share Jesus with a culture that's characterized by unbelief? You have to believe it yourself first. It's, you have to believe that he's your king and treasure. And then you have to be prepared that some people are going to rejoice with you and some people are going to reject you. That's what happens, right? Last two verses here. Verse 39. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The Pharisees saw the very same things as the disciples. This the very same mighty works, but they didn't believe. They didn't believe that that was the difference. They didn't believe. They understood, though, what was going on. They understood Jesus was claiming to be the king. They understand that if he was the king, that he should be worshipped, but they didn't believe he was the king. And you know what? If Jesus got that rejection, why would we think anything different? And you know what? If I was one of the Pharisees, I think, and I didn't believe, I would respond the exact same way. When people in our culture and our neighbors respond with complete disbelief with us, I can understand that. Because if they don't believe that Jesus is that, then that sounds like craziness or blasphemy. Imagine if you were the Pharisees, you walk into church this morning, and we sing the first song this morning. Come, Christians, join to sing. Alleluia, amen. Loud praise to Bob Johnson, our king. Alleluia, amen. I hope there'd be some heads turning. I hope there'd be some people with problems. And that's what the Pharisees think is going on. So they're upset and they say, Jesus, stop this. And how does Jesus respond? If they are silent, the stones will cry out. Now, people think this could mean different things. That that, that maybe out of Isaiah 55, Jesus is saying that literally, Isaiah 55 says the mountains and hills will cry out, that the creation is rejoicing at this day. If the disciples don't rejoice, the creation will. And that's possible. Some people think that Jesus is quoting Habakkuk 2.11, which is judgment on the Babylonians for their sin. And he says that the stones will cry out against the Babylonians to warn them of the judgment because of their sin. And some people think that that's what Jesus is talking about. And you know what? I think it's both. I think Jesus is saying that the stones are going to cry out both ways. Jesus is the son of God sent to earth to save us from our sin, to save us from Satan, to save us from death. And all the miracles and the resurrection is going to testify that this is the king. He is the savior. And you know what? That we rejoice with creation. But if we don't rejoice, that even the creation will warn us of the dire choice we are making not to believe in Jesus. We see these two types of people, two different responses to Jesus. And there's no third option for Luke. You may say, there has to be a third option. I mean, I don't believe in Jesus, but I'm not, I'm not just completely in unbelief. There's only two options. You may struggle with this and want a third option, but there isn't. Jesus claims to be the only king, the only savior, the only way to God. And our culture would say that's so close-minded. That, 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 what about other religions and philosophies? You know what's helpful for me when I think about that? It's something Tim Keller says when he encounters that question. He says, every other religion has prophets and teachers that say they are the way for you to go find God. Jesus is the only one who says that he's coming to you because he is God. And so, either Jesus is wrong, if Jesus is lying or he's a lunatic, he's wrong that he's vastly inferior to all other religions and you should not believe. But if Jesus is right, then he is greatly superior and he is God. And if Jesus rose from the dead, the only one to ever rise from the dead, then it shows that he is who he says he is. Those are the only two options we have. 
There's no third option. You either receive Jesus as Savior and Lord and treasure, or you reject him in disbelief. And we have to leave people with the option or question, what will you do with Jesus? This morning, if you're here and you've never responded to place your faith in Jesus Christ, please come talk to one of us. Talk to me. Talk to someone in our church. Talk to the person who brought you. We're not going to force anything on you. We would like to introduce you to this Jesus and help you see why he's worthy to be your king and savior and Lord. In church, there's an important lesson for us here as well. If Jesus was disbelieved and rejected, we should expect to be sometimes as well. But think about Jesus' reaction to those who disbelieve, right? When Jesus, when when they disbelieved, did did he try to argue with them, force them into a positive response? No, right? He lays out their responsibility and says, you gotta make a choice. Right, here's the truth. What are you going to do with it? There's no third option. But at the same time, did Jesus, when they were not believing, just write them off, say, nah, forget you? No. He, he, he appealed to them. He said, the, even the stones will cry out. Don't you realize the dire consequences of making this choice? And that's our work as the church. That we are to be God's witnesses, to call people to the responsibility of understanding Jesus and the choice that they have to make. That people, everyone's on this continuum from unbelieving to a point where they understand and may believe. And our, if we have five minutes with somebody, we want to walk, we want to walk them five minutes along farther. Little by little by little, we want to help them to understand. Not force them. We want to walk with them. But also, not write people off, but also warn them, call them of the dire results of their their choices. So we want to be prepared for a variety of reactions to Jesus. Some will not believe, but we have to still speak the truth to them. We still have to love them. We still have to call them to consider that responsibility of the choice they're making. And then we pray for them and trust that God can work in their hearts. And some will believe though. That's why we go out there. For the sake of his kingdom and his name, God will do miracles through us if we're just faithful to share his gospel. And that brings us back to the first question, right? As we close. How do we share Jesus in a culture that's characterized by unbelief? How do we respond and live in a post-Christian America? My friends, there's a lot of people out there right now that their response is to, to clench your fist and wring your hands and, 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 and to shout at the rooftops. But that's not what Luke is doing here when he, when he presents Jesus to a Gentile, unbelieving culture. We may not be the moral majority. In fact, I don't think we ever were. But as Russell Moore says, that we can be called the prophetic minority. We are a minority. Those of us who truly believe that Jesus is who he says he is, we are strangers and aliens here. We're very different from the culture. But we are not a minority who isolates ourselves. That we have a prophetic job as a church with a mission and a message to engage with. We're not kings. We don't have authority that way. But we are prophets with a a, a witnessing job to tell of Jesus and his truth. My friends, there are 36.1 million nuns in America who are lost without Jesus, destined to spend eternity in hell. But we have a message for them. And as the church, as the culture changes, they're going to have to look at us as something different about us. That, That we have a message of our Savior King and his glorious free grace. That's not something to be afraid of, this difference. It's our mission field that we need to understand our unconventional king who is both triumphant and humble, whose kingdom is already and not yet, so we live both engaged and as aliens. And we need to be prepared for the unmistakable responses to our king. Do we, check your heart, do you live and act different like Jesus is your king and treasure? You know what? Some people may reject that. And you're going to love them. You're going to speak the truth to them. You're going to continue to engage with them and pray for them. But you know what? Some are going to respond and trust Jesus. For the sake of God and his name and his kingdom, some will trust if we're faithful to share. So as we leave here this morning, let's go into our unbelieving culture and do what the God has called the church to do. Let's share the message of our unconventional king and fulfill the mission that although some will not believe, there will be those for his name and the sake of his love for the world that God will bring to belief in salvation. Let me pray.